And it's now my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker this evening, Natasha Kalita. Natasha is a graduate student at UBC in educational psychology who lives well with bipolar disorder and is the founder of Redefining Bipolar, which engages the community on mental health issues around both personal and research perspectives. She's also the co-founder of SHARE, Self-Harm Anonymous Recovery and Education. In her spare time, she draws portraits, paints, goes to metal shows, and continues to dye her hair with startling colors at random. So one of my most anticipated things tonight was seeing what color Natasha's hair would be when I got here this evening. Natasha, we are very honored to have you here tonight to share your story. Let's everyone please give her a warm welcome. Thanks everyone. Um, so I'm going to start tonight with a terrible joke and I apologize in advance, but it's a knock knock joke. So that means that all of you have to respond to me. <laughs> so are you ready? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Knock knock. Who's there? Who's stigmatizing? <laughs> that is something we're going to think about today in Social Stigma 101. <laughs> Before I go on with my presentation though, I want to put a special thanks out to the Collaborative Research Team for Psychosocial Issues and Bipolar Disorder, otherwise known as Crest BD, for helping me take flight with, not the good flight, not the manic flight, um, with my, my uh, mental health awareness online. And a special thanks to Erin Mahalik for, as the kids say these days, for being awesome. So I'm gonna start you guys off with a little mental exercise. Oh, and before that, though, I'm going to let you know that you can tweet us today, right now, at Redefine Bipolar, and I'll get back to you when I'm back in my seat. Or you can tweet at Crest underscore BD, and they are currently live tweeting right now. And now we're going to do a, a mental exercise. So imagine with me that you're sitting in a classroom, kind of like a lecture hall like this, where you know some teacher's talking, you're just in a mass of people. Now imagine you're talking something about mental health and the teacher starts talking about mental illness in a derogatory way. So this could be something like depressed people are lazy or schizophrenics are violent. And we can even put the emotional twist on it and say that women are way more emotional than men or that real men don't cry. Stigma tells many tales. So this is a scenario that I actually went through and we're gonna come back to it at the end of my presentation. Right now, we're gonna actually unpack what social stigma is. And I really wanna stress during this presentation that even though what everything I'm telling you is going to be informed by research, it's still just my personal perspective on things. And I do study educational psychology, so the education, as you see, will sweep through. The main question we're gonna ask ourselves tonight is, what do we do in this situation? So let's unpack mental health or social stigma and mental health while we're at it. So what is social stigma? In a very simplified way, because social stigma is a very complex phenomena, I'm defining social stigma as the use of negative stereotypes that intentionally or unintentionally causes someone with a mental health condition to feel negatively about themselves. I want this to be inclusive though, so that we are including everyday mental health symptoms like depression or anxiety and not just limiting it to mental illness because after all, people with mental illness have mental health. So why exactly do we have social stigma? And you'll find again that these reasons are very rooted in education because it's my own bias, but I think it's important. So as I always say, use your critical thinking skills and. As always, these are, there are more reasons that social stigma exists, and these are just the four that I want to focus on tonight. So my first reason is that none of us were really taught about mental health. Dare I say none of us were actually taught about mental health because the K-12 system in Canada doesn't have a curriculum dedicated completely to mental health and mental illness. This is changing, though, so it's really good to note that, and we are moving a better direction. 
The second point to note is that universities are just beginning to address mental health. This is not just in the sense of students getting services to support their mental health, but it's also in the sense of teachers being prepared to address mental health and mental illness and learning about it. And on an entirely, like a bigger level than that, it's in research institutions and universities where we have people who did not grow up with mental health awareness, didn't grow up knowing um, what mental illness was or what it realistically looks like. And they bring that into their research perspective, which not, I'm not saying everyone does this, but it does happen. And so you get that perspective trickling through into things like healthcare and education as a consequence. So if we're not learning about social stigma or mental health or mental illness in school, where are we learning it? From the media, usually. I mean, sometimes we learn from friends and people around us in our communities, but a large amount of time we see mental illness in the media. So anything from articles to movies to podcasts, uh, we often forget that big corporations or things like you know, the New York Times or uh, CBC or anything, any of these big bodies of information are really just people like us. Sometimes they're experts, but sometimes they're not. And even if they are experts, are they informed? These are questions that we need to be asking. The last reason I'll leave you with is that historically speaking, emotions are scary. We don't want to talk about emotions. And as someone who has bipolar disorder, I've had to go to the places where I have to think about killing myself. I'm that depressed that those emotions are circulating within me. And for a long time, I didn't have any guidance on that. There was no template for me to follow. So yes, it's terrifying. We're scared of these things. That's totally OK. But we're, we've been too scared, in a sense. Although, on the other hand, there are people who are becoming so scared that they're like, I can't do this on my own, and I'm going to tell everyone about it like I am now. And so we have pioneers in mental health who are putting templates in place, who are allowing for guidance to be possible. So those are just a few reasons why social stigma could exist. What can we do about social stigma? That's kind of what we're here for, right? So there are lots of things that we can do about social stigma. From a research perspective, we don't actually have a lot of tools and techniques. It's very informal right now, very theoretical. So I'm going to give you three steps that makes sense to me that I use in my everyday life. So step one is to take one day at a time. We have to realize that social stigma is not going to be solved overnight. We can see events like this one that you're at right now as small victories that will add up over time. Because even if you look back five years, there weren't as nearly as many events that we have today so you can see the progression when you look back in time. And now we're having a lot more open conversation than we were before. From a higher perspective, if we thought about this and we say, OK, everyone's on board with mental health and mental illness tomorrow, what would happen? At, at a systems level, we're not ready for that. Can you imagine the lines up, uh, lineups at hospitals? Counselors would be getting calls. Everyone's in distress and they know it. They want help. We're simply not ready for that. As much as I hate social stigma, I think it's really good to be patient here because we can strategically, as we go forward, deconstructing stigma, we can plan the best way for people to access healthcare services. We can plan the best way to destigmatize our society. My step two is called reducing language barriers. So as in my bipolar experiences, I've had to do really weird things with labeling my emotions. So for example, I've had to find the difference between authentic and perceived happiness because of how mania has skewed my emotional experiences. Since people generally aren't taught how to label their own emotions, we have to give them language that they already use instead of giving them a whole new vocabulary. It's like trying to teach people overnight how to speak a foreign language. So we have to reduce language barriers, not completely jump over them, because that's unrealistic right now. Stress, I think, is a really great example for this. So everyone can kind of relate to stress, right? 
it's something that we all experience to one extent or another. So for example, I'll ask my friend one day, you know, like, how are you doing? And she'll be like, oh, I'm so stressed out right now. And I'll be like, oh my God, why? Please, here, I need a hug, come on, let's bring it in. And she'll be like, I, I'm just like, my boss is totally just down on me and I, I can't cope with what's going on right now. And so we'll, we'll delve into that situation together. We'll figure out what's going on for her. But I'm not gonna tell her that she's experiencing anxiety because I don't know that for sure. Even though if that's what I think she's experiencing, I'm gonna listen to her. I'm gonna see how she's defining mental health for herself. So in this way, we can be guides. We can guide people in their mental health and through their mental illnesses if need be. Instead of trying to pull them or push them in one direction or the other. So guide them instead of convert them. My final step is understand understanding. And while this makes no sense as you see it, it will in a second. So let me unpack this a little bit more. So think of understanding as your sense of self uh, or your identity is my favorite word possibly. And I'll give you an example for this. So the word bipolar has come to mean so much to me because it's been a huge part of my life for better and for worse but it has created so many amazing opportunities for me. And it's really meant a lot for me because it's allowed me to pursue my passions in life. So when I see someone walking down the street and I overhear someone say, oh, she's acting so bipolar today. Like that disrespects my understanding of the word bipolar. It disrespects how much that word has come to mean to me. So in essence, it's a lack of understanding of my own understanding of that word. And what this is trying to illustrate is that we really need to start putting each other in each other's shoes more. So we need to be more compassionate with one another. To reverse the situation, however, I understand that she doesn't necessarily understand what bipolar means. So I should probably tell her what it means to me. Of course, that does mean addressing social stigma firsthand. And not all of us can do that. Not all of us want to do that, which is totally fine. You don't have to be a mental health superhero, you know? <laughs> um, but the point being, we can all be a little more compassionate about each other. We can all try to understand our own understandings of the world. So I'm gonna take you back to my terrible joke now. Apologies, in fact, you have to feel this with me. <laughs> Cringe with me. So back to the bad joke, who's stigmatizing who? I hope that's something you can think about and chew on through what I've just said, through the three steps that I've walked you through. And I'm gonna go back to that scenario that I told you about if you're in a classroom. So what the actual scenario actually was, is I was in the fourth year of my undergraduate degree and I was in a behavior disorders course and so it made sense we were talking about mental illness. And we spent about 30 minutes approximately through a whole semester on bipolar disorder, which I have problems with on my own. But for the sake of today's conversation, <laughs> we're just gonna talk about the content of that presentation. So in that 30 minutes, we were presented with me and a whole bunch of other people, some of who were hoping to be clinicians one day, were presented with three, Three statistics, that's it, three statistics, and I'll put them in my own words for you. So the first one was, I'm more likely to kill myself than most other people. The second one was that I will probably go off my meds at some point because who likes medication? And the third point was that if I'm not already abusing a substance, I will most likely abuse a substance. So these are statistics that are in the literature, they do exist. My problem here was with how they were framed. So especially in a class where you're teaching people who want to be dealing with people who have mental illnesses, you can't just say these negative things about them. You can't just tell someone in a room that, you know, you're, you're, you've only got these negative things, you know, you're only gonna do badly. You know, the, the messages that were really lacking was like, you're gonna do well, you could do well, you can live well with mental illness, but that wasn't present in this course. And a course that was dedicated 
to mental illness. So I asked you what you would do in this scenario. So what, what did I do? What was my response? So at first, I actually didn't do anything. I felt completely stigmatized. No one had prepared me for this situation, so I had no idea what to do. But after class, I did complain to a friend, and that made me feel a lot better. So where there is social stigma, there can also be social support. Sometimes you just have to reach out and grab it. But I still felt like I needed to right a wrong. And so I decided to start a seminar later that year on mood disorders. So it was about me and 10 other people. And throughout the term, we talked about mood disorders. We picked the research we wanted to pick. We dissected it from a personal experience. So a lot of us came in there with histories of bipolar disorder or depression. And we looked at the statistics. We found methodological prob problems. So we looked at how research bias can actually play into how mental illness is experienced. And it just felt like my truth had arisen out of this classroom. It felt like this is what I should have been taught in my behavior disorders class. And now I am here talking to you. So that's a, been a leap a little bit. So <laughs> I'm not saying you have to be like a mental health activist or anything like that. Um, but the point I hope I can illustrate to you tonight is that you can go from feeling stigmatized, alone, isolated, can't deal with social stigma whatsoever, and you can live a wonderful life. You can pursue your passions, you can pursue your dreams, and you can be amaz amazingly, tremendously happy, and you don't have to be a mental health advocate. You can just be whatever you want to be. That is in within your power, and social stigma does not have to stop you. On that note, I'm going to leave you with a quotation that I really love. And it goes something like this. Never give up on someone with a mental illness. When the I is replaced by we, illness becomes wellness. Take that home with you tonight. Sleep on it and never forget it. Thank you so much for listening to me tonight. Thanks, Natasha. Thank you very, very much, Natasha. You could just feel the collective tweet <laughs> when you put up that quote. And about 18 people pulled up their phones and took a picture of that quote. Really powerful. Thank you. I was going to make a knock-knock joke, but I won't do that now. <laughs> Thank you very much.